Well, thank you. Yeah, good to be here. Um, I guess my sort of two careers are really being a pastor and then something which emerged, which was quite strange when I first started writing, which was going to particular places and speaking. And I didn't really know what was going on at the beginning, but I noticed that everywhere I got asked to tended to be a certain type of city. Downtown Los Angeles, Wellington in New Zealand, Copenhagen in Denmark, uh, London, San Francisco, Portland, uh, cities that were very much like mine, which had deliberately taken a kind of new identity on. A lot of these cities have sort of antecedents of being bohemian or different in the past, but really had reinvented themselves to be these new contexts. And the P word, which is everywhere now, progressive, uh, the equivalent of governor of my state has just said he wants our state and our capital city to be the most progressive state in the whole of Australia. And it's a really interesting word. And I think it's a word that's actually come up and crept up on the church. If you think about the word progressive, there's a whole world view contained within that world. It means, A, that actually history is moving in a particular direction. It contains the idea, it's not value free, it contains the idea that you're either going to be on the wrong side or the right side of history. In many ways, the mechanics behind it uh, sort of mirror Hegel's thought that sort of taking almost God out of the equation and turning God, who providentially moves in history, into the zeitgeist, the spirit of the day, that the cities that you and I ministered in have an alternate theology going on that we don't need God to move us towards the place we need to go, that we can reach a kind of kingdom of heaven on earth, minus the king. The fruit of biblical shalom minus the dying to self that happens in the Christian story. So one of the languages that we've used to talk about these sort of progressive environments and it begins to sort of it gets spoken about at different times. Leslie Newbigin sort of mentions it in the 1960s, but it grows, comes really into age. Uh, one of the great P words uh, is uh, post-Christian. And what's really interesting is one of the ways that we spoke about post-Christianity in that sort of great discussion that happened in the Western church beginning in the 1990s, where so many of the calibrations occurred to get us to where we are now, is almost this idea that Christianity had reached this point where it lost all cultural influence and we'd return to a kind of year zero where Christianity had no longer any influence and therefore where we were now was in this post-Christian time and essentially what we were dealing with were pagan people. Again, another P word, pagan. You heard people starting to talk about the fact, well, I'm not in a church, a mega church in the suburbs, I'm downtown with the pagans. This crept in. This became a little badge of honor. There was this differentiation made between a type of ministry that had occurred and had reached people particularly in the second half of the 20th century, which seemed to be able to reach people who were part of that great explosion, that World War II turbo charge that happened in your country and mine, as Europe was in ruins, the industrialized, militarized economy then started spewing out consumer goods into the world, and we had the creation of this mass culture. The whole megachurch movement, the whole contemporary church movement grows out of that place. But in the 90s, this sense that it was not working. And a few sort of thoughts come together, and I'm going to get excited and draw on this magnificent beast. So... At the 90s, you have these sort of streams coming together. One is that we're now in a post-Christian moment. That, that's one. The second one is the idea of church growth movement. And the church growth movement is really interesting because if you look at its origins, essentially what it is, it comes from guys like Peter Wagner, Donald McGavran, who are missionaries in non-Western contexts, but then come back to the United States 
and basically look at it and see an increasingly secularizing culture and then sort of put two and two together and go, hang on, what would it look like if we approached our Western context, which is looking more pagan, but with a missiological framework? So instead of, if you're in uh, Africa, instead of looking at how tribal systems work and animism, how do you actually look at sort of those bridges to the gospel stories uh, which can be used to explain the gospel, sort of culturally dynamic modes to bridge that gap between Christianity and culture. What does that look like in the West? There's a turn to best practices in business. And so this sort of missiological stream comes into the church and creates really the sort of contemporary church movement. I'll just let you know I can't spell or write at this point. And then the third thing, we got onto it a little bit late, but very much this idea that we had reached postmodern times. Postmodernism, a term, postmodern, uh, that emerges really out of the French left's dismay that in 1968 the proletariat, the working class, did not join them in revolution and de Gaulle's France stayed, and as that Marxist dream collapsed, then this giving up on the great dreams of changing the whole of culture, and postmodernism is sort of born into the West, touching all kinds of different things, literature, architecture, everything, and it sort of started to die down really, but then in the 90s, Christians discovered it, And there was a point where if you put into Google, almost, you know, the amount of Christian articles compared to non-Christian articles just jumped over, and postmodernism became this word. It was like, do you have jammy bars that, like, burglars use to, like, break into windows? You know those bars with the... Yeah, Yeah, good. Um, (laughs) I don't know some of those things. Postmodernism became like a jammy bar that you just used, well, we're no longer going to meet in rows, we're going to meet in a circle. Church boards, like, why? Postmodernism, okay, well, you go ahead then. It became this thing to justify anything, and it was really a complex theory. Is it an epoch? Is it a movement? Have we worked this out yet? Probably not. But really, these ideas come together, this idea of the postmodern, the idea that we're now in a post-Christian age, the idea of contemporary church, and comes together with, I summarize all of these movements into this great drive for relevance. Now we could, if we're being pedantic, go back to frontier missions, we could go back to the beginnings of the 1920s where there was this, look at Foursquare uh, origins, this blending of popular culture, cinema, celebrity and Christianity, but they triumph in the 90s. And this looks like different things, this looks like the seeker-sensitive movement. This looks like the emerging church. This looks like the beginnings of progressive Christianity in some places. This looks like the beginnings of the missional discussion. All of these things come together in this belief that we can adopt a missiological framework that we can reach this kind of post-Christian culture. Now what's happening at the 90s is something really interesting. The 90s is this period where on November the 9th, 1989, something incredible happens. A young man makes a call at the Russian embassy calling for the tanks to come and come out of the military barracks and crush a popular uprising that's happening. This young man is told over the phone from the Kremlin, we will not be sending the tanks. That young man is a young KGB station officer called Vladimir Putin. And Germans begin to climb in that wall, a spectacularly mulleted Dable Hasselhoff with a glowing sweater sings a German freedom song on the wall and the entire Cold War collapses at that moment. Was it Putin? Was it Hasselhoff? I'll let you decide. (laughs) But basically at that point, history changes. This great defining epoch where communism left and right, communism, capitalism had battled then seems to collapse. 
all of a sudden, this is the period where Francis Fukuyama, the American eminent political scientist, says, we've reached the end of history. If history as we understood it was this battle between left and right, it's now over. Bill Clinton and Tony Blair bring pro politics to the middle. Anthony Giddens, the sociologist, begins to talk about the third way. It's a new era. The economies of the West, after a hiccup at the beginning of the 90s, enter into a period of boom. That's my symbol of boom. And we see this seeming period of peace happen in the world. No one mentions the fact that the Great War of Africa occurred and approximately three million people perished. Nevertheless, for the West, this is a period where everything seems to change. And there's a, there's a kind of drunken headiness that occurs at this new beginning that we, the church, can come up with the answer to this process of secularization that's been occurring for hundreds of years by solving it with candles or changing things a little bit or not meeting in a church building but meeting at the cafe. And I was one of these people. But then what happens is the world begins to change again. We have 9-11. We have the birth of the 21st century. And where we stand now begins to look very differently. There was this point that I remember it in the 90s. I remember being on a sort of retreat thing with some students. We'd taken away sharing the gospel with them, and that sort of belief where, oh, that's good for you, man. That sort of loose, relaxed, 90s, slacker relativism now seems to have passed. In the progressive environments that we find ourselves in, that coming to the political middle is now over. All over the world, politics are now returning to a harder right and a harder left. The idea that the current electoral cycle in your country could be between a populist, anti-immigration, far-right uh, right candidate and to have a character like Bernie Sanders, who seemed to have passed histories, was over with the Bernie Sanders of the world, to have Jeremy Corbyn, a far leftist who hangs out with Hezbollah and is an apologist for the IRA and goes on Putin's TV channel as the leader of the Labour Party in Britain. This is not just in the Western Anglosphere. This is all throughout the world. We just had Duarte, the Filipino Trump elected. We have far left parties coming to power. Five years ago, I heard someone say that the future is Sweden where you have a political system of far leftist radical lesbians and far right ex-Nazis that's the increasing direction where everything's changed. And in this environment, this new progressive moment has slipped from that sort of laid-back relativism to a new sort of alternative utopian belief. But we don't necessarily storm the Winter Palace, but history slowly moves us towards this beautiful Scandinavian future. Where the enlightened people in cities like yours and mine who read the right books, have the right organic products, hold the correct progressive political views, will bring about that kingdom without the king. And what's really interesting is the great story that we told here was, hey, You can be Christian and still be cool. We can give you a Christianity that's not religious. We got completely sideswiped by the fact that there is a religious element, as Jody Bottom, the Catholic cultural critic, says is, in this new progressive moment, there is a religiosity to it. Shame, which... Christopher Lash, in his book, Revolts of the Elite, said had disappeared from the American landscape, is back. John Ronson's book, You've Been Shamed, all of a sudden now, you say the wrong thing, and it's the scarlet letter all over again, or you have that, not A for adultery on your chest, but you're a bigot. 
And interestingly, in this new environment, convincing people that you're cool, that you can sit in that cool restaurant, that you look like the rest of the world, that your music is exactly the same, that you can inhabit and, and, and enculturate and incarnate into a place becomes irrelevant if you don't adhere to the ways and means of this progressive direction in which we're heading. And what this offers, particularly for the young leaders amongst us, is seemingly a Christian vision where you can be into social justice. You can be into the dream of a better world. You can be into racial reconciliation and you can have all these things and live in a city where it just seems to be getting better every day. More coffee, more restaurants. And you can have all that stuff which the relevant contemporary church seem to promise you, but without the strictures of organized religion, without the limits on individual will, without the Christian sexual ethic, you can have all of these things. So across the Western world, we see this dynamic of young people leaving faith at 25, but it does not seem to be a leap into a sort of mid-century existential Albert Camus, complete void of disbelief. What it is, is you've progressed. It's a mark, a tick on your chest. And so the new conversion story, increasingly in American Christianity, is the de-conversion story. I once was part of organized dogmatic religion, and then I de-evolved, and now I have progressed, and that's the new religious moment. So the strategy of relevance, which has engineered and powered us for the last 20 years, increasingly in cities like yours and mine, no longer has power. And so I'm advocating a different posture, but I'm just gonna let you decompress Turn to the person next to you. Is this mad Australian right or wrong? Discuss. <laughs> okay. I'll just pull you back in. We will have some time for questions. We'll integrate as we go. I do want to drill down. This one will just be theoretical. I do want to sort of drill down into... Um, some processes. But, but part of this is that the cultural mood changed. And ironically, the people who most triumphed the idea that the church need to catch up with the cultural change were the ones who missed the next cultural change. Two really interesting thinkers, uh, Belgian, Vermeulen and Van der Akkers, and they essentially say that we've reached a new cultural point, and many people have missed it. In fact, I'd say that again, many Christians have missed it. Um, just to give you a really quick way of understanding this, um, there's the classic movie Metropolis, Fritz Lang. Has anyone seen Fritz Lang's Metropolis? Some people might have had to watch it in film school if you did that at college or something. Um, incredible, incredible movie. Um, it's the story, it's a very Catholic tale, Fritz Lang's sort of Catholic uh, uh, roots coming through. It's the story of a, a culture where people who are the, in the elite live up the very top of the culture and it's this sort of privileged elite and they frolic in gardens and they look very sort of German and Aryan above this giant sort of ziggurat underneath which is this machine, the entire world metropolis, the city in which they live is this machine and this huge industrial, you know, sort of uh, monster. There's a bit in it when he looks at it and uh, the sort of this protagonist comes down from the city and goes into the bottom and he looks at it and he, he yells at Moloch, Moloch. It's this link to the machine and the industrial age being this thing which is sacrificing people. There's all the stuff of class in there, upper class versus lower class. And classically, Metropolis is a sort of movie looking into the future. Um, and this was really about modernity. The idea that the modern project was moving us in a direction. At the center of it, there's some doubts. Where will this modern project take us? But at the end of the movie, the sort of classic feminine character brings together the working class and the sort of uh, uh, upper class. And whilst the sort of city falls apart, the people are redeemed, the modern project seems to work. 
Then you go forward, a movie which references Metropolis, which was the classic. I remember in the 90s, it came out in 1982, but in the 90s, people were like, I've got to rediscover this movie. In Melbourne, all the guys I was hanging with were like, rediscover it. And that was Ridley Scott's Blade Runner. Blade Runner is set in a futuristic Los Angeles, um, not far from now. I can't remember the exact year when it's set, but soonish. In it, most of the people have left the planet. The world is overcome by some sort of environmental disaster. Only really the sort of skerrits of society are left. In Los Angeles, they speak this sort of tongue, which is a combination of Japanese and Spanish and English. It's this completely messy, industrial, futuristic Los Angeles, written at a time when the sort of urban core of Los Angeles was increasingly a no-go zone. And really, it tells the story of post-modernity, what happens when this great project of modernity collapses and the future is terrible. Now, part of the reason, I think, that the church jumped into the postmodern analysis, and it's really interesting, if you look at so many of the movements, which many of us may find ourselves a part, and myself particularly, if you look at the emerging movement, if you look at the missional movement, if you look at the new reform movement, if you look at the progressive movement, so many of these movements go back to that time when it felt like postmodernism was here, and there were different reactions to that reality. I think part of the reason we were drawn to this is because postmodernism and the vision of Blade Runner seem to say that this big thing, modernity, which is secularizing us, which seems to promise a heaven on earth through technology and, and industry and politics, that it's actually failing or it will fail. There's a point where it will collapse and the world will look like Blade Runner and things are going to be so terrible, people will turn back to God. That was a great hope. That people will be so exhausted by Western culture that we will turn back to God. And so that's where the conversations start. If we can just make the church relevant to this postmodern environment, and so much of postmodernism was deconstructing, so people began to deconstruct in two ways. Some people deconstructed theology and orthodoxy, other people deconstructed church form. Some did both. And so that's where much of the discussion has remained. So many of the roots of people planting churches now, many of us read different books reacting to this. But Vermeulen and van der Ackers, I think they're at the University of Antwerp uh, or Erasmus University, said that we're in this new place. For a while, people, probably since the early 90s, outside of the church, have been saying that postmodern thing is over. Where are we now? People began to talk about post postmodernism. Oh my goodness, it's just getting ridiculous. Um, and there's all these other theses uh, Bauman's liquid modernity, super modernity, um, hyper modernity is another one. Um, but what Vermeulen and van der Acker, I think they have the most interesting thing, and they call it meta modernism. Now, if you just tell people this in Portland, you are just going to be ahead of the game. Just drop that and say, yeah, a lot of those churches are postmodern, but we're more metamodern. And people are like, oh my goodness, you will be king. Um, what they say is, what's really interesting is that they use the word meta in terms of something going between two poles. And so where we are now is we're swinging between the promise and idealism of modernity but the disillusionment of postmodernity simultaneously. Millennium Park, Obama's inauguration. I was got to be careful to talk about politics in another country. Uh, but that moment, watching it as an Australian, oh my goodness, that was like literally the Messiah had arrived. I remember Brad Pitt was in the audience crying with Angelina Jolie. I thought Obama would just start walking into air and, and hover but the expectations that were put on him, this was this incredible, what, what Vermeulen and van der Ackers say is, it's a return of longing. Longing's back. In this, all of the characters in Blade Runner, Deckard, Rachel, they're like androids, they're like unfeeling, they're just like completely cynical. 
Ridley Scott uses the, the motif of a 1940s film noir where you have this classic moment after World War II when you had the arising of this sort of character in film noir where you had these guys who'd been in the war and they'd come back and they'd seen killing and they'd seen the tough stuff of life and they looked at life from this distance. He uses that because the Postmodern period was about cynicism, it was about irony, but what you saw is this intense longing. What you see now is this longing, particularly in this election cycle, Yuval, Yuval Levin says that it's a longing for a nostalgic past. On one hand, in the conservative right, you see this longing for that Reagan moment. Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton being pushed to the left for this moment in the 1960s where they could afford this sort of welfare state, this longing for Scandinavia. And it's not Scandinavia now, it's actually Scandinavia of the 1960s. This intense longing for something. You see this in the stories that we tell to our young people, that they can have this incredible impact in the world. They can be world changers. Never before has a generation had so much promise put on them. You look at university advertising now, it's you're a world changer. The latest Levi's commercial of these people putting on the jeans. No longer do they just hang out back looking like a sort of cool cowboy or James Dean. They're now heading into Manhattan conquering the world. So there's this huge longing, the promise of Silicon Valley, where you literally have people like Peter Thiel talking about the fact that there's this group of, of Silicon Valley entrepreneurs who now are aiming for immortality, that the internet can bring the world together, that Facebook can heal the world, this intense longing out there. But then what Vermeulen and Van der Acker say is that it then hits this point where it can't be reached and then returns to irony. The girl in her 20s who goes to the party looking fantastic. Never before has she had so many fashions and ways of watching YouTube channels, of putting on her makeup, of constructing herself in this incredible way, all the potentials of the world before her, who she can be, her identity, how she can construct this and that, the sexual persona she'll put into the world, the political persona, the style, aesthetic persona she can put into the world, all the longing, but then returning home crippled by anxiety, crippled by indecision, crippled by social panic. We live in a world where we have these moments of intense promise, a new thing, it's gonna be this answer to this particular disease and the next item in the news is ISIS. So we're swinging between this attempt to have this long but not then being able to respond to that. The great problem is, is that the moment where in the past people would come to the end of themselves and there would be this opening to the gospel is that there's so many different things you can explore. You try and work in the city and get head in high finance and you fall in on yourself and you get burnt out. There's this opportunity for the gospel, but then there's yoga. <laughs> and you're really getting into yoga and just the simple stuff and then it's like yoga in a hot room and now there's nude yoga, that's just wrong. And there's like, you know, this is the thing. And then yoga doesn't do it to you. Well, then you move to Thailand, you know. And there's just this constant spinning of options where we never get to this point fully because culture seems to offer us something. Turn to the person next to you and discuss where you've seen that phenomenon of swinging between longing and hopelessness. I want to come back to... I want to come back to where I began and the idea, Jody Bottom's idea, that the progressive Christian... Sorry, the progressive culture reflects a kind of Christianity emptied of Christ. What he says is really interesting is, you know, there have been a number of studies done, particularly one done, I think it was done in the 1970s, and the, the whole study said that when a denomination or a church becomes liberal, 
it signs its own death warrant eventually. That once you head into complete liberal theology, it's only a matter of time before that, that, that place is emptied of people. John Shelby Spong, one of the most famous sort of liberal Christian apologists who's written the popular field, when he became, you know, bishop, I think it was, was it New Jersey or something, you know, they just lost hundreds and hundreds, thousands of people, I think, um, from that diocese. So his book career went up, his church attendance went down. And that's never a good thing. And the idea that Jody Bottom essentially says in my language is, he says that the current cultural mode that you will find in a Portland or a Melbourne is where the public sphere feels like liberal Christianity. The idea that, in a way, it's like liberal Christianity is a truck bomb which blows itself up getting on the nightly news and changing the cultural landscape while destroying itself as an ecclesiological force. So people believe there's this idea that, well, you know, they're happy to tolerate Christianity as long as it follows the lines which enable the individual expression to have their fullest reign. So another way I think we need to look at post-Christianity is not this moment where it's back to ground zero and we're dealing with people in coffee shops in Portland like they're, you know, tribes people from Papua New Guinea, but actually that they're trying to go beyond Christianity and achieve its goals minus Christ, discipleship, orthodoxy and submission of the will. And in many ways, when you look at that trajectory, it would have been here before. And depending on who you talk to, when it arises in history, but in many ways, this is very similar to the heresies that the church found itself facing at different times. In particular, the Gnostic heresy. Now, I'm not saying going to say that there's a, this continual train of belief from the second, third, fourth centuries to now where people have secretly had a church of Gnosticism. But Gnosticism basically worked in this idea that the individual was stuck here on earth and earth was not created good, but earth was created by a God who was inferior or broken. That this God created the world and they were copying a greater God somewhere, that this world is a bad facsimile. This is like my friend who lives in Thailand's cell phone, which is not a blackberry, it's a blockberry. <laughs> Made somewhere in a shanty town or whatever. It looks the same, but it's just not right, and it's pretty rubbish. So this world is not a great place. This is a place where those people who get a moment of insight become enlightened. When they realize that inside of them is a divine spark, the potential for greatness, the possibility of Godhood in the individual self. And once they realize that, they're able to escape from this world. Now, the early Gnostics, and you can trace this back to different thinkers, essentially believed that what was wrong with the world, that it was made of matter. They held the spirit above matter. In our contemporary secularist Gnostic mantra, the problem with this world is not that it's made of matter, but that it's mundane. Hell is standing in a rural town in Target with a, with a pusher, with a couple of screaming kids and bills to pay and nothing exciting happening. You must escape that. You see that there's something different in you. You see the world differently. You enlighten yourself. How do you enlighten yourself? Through gnosis, Greek for knowledge. The way out is to recognize that you are someone who has found that divine spark and now in the world there's these sparks of knowledge and you've got to hunt around and find them. You've got to go to the gatherings of the other Gnostics, the enlightened one, where fellow people are enlightened like you. 
realizing the divine spark within. So you move to a Melbourne or a Portland where people get it. Not like those people in the south or in Australia's case, the people in the north. (laughs) Not those rednecks who just, if they just could find the divine spark within, be educated, get their science right, get the right political theory, then could emerge into enlightenment and knowledge. In the Gnostic imagination, their churches, fascinatingly, that the Gnostics had were this gathering where they came together. They didn't like institutional strictures or rules. They preferred highfalutin intellectual conversations. And so they came together in these little gatherings that were rambunctious, sort of unflowing, uh, sorry, just these, these unorganized things, because in their mind, (coughs) institutions, rules, strictures, these were things of the material world, so they gathered themselves in these alternative forms of Christian community and spent their time critiquing people in the Orthodox churches who were not smart enough, who didn't get it. You see that in churches today who fit this mold? I've been there, man. I have done that. I have looked down my nose at other people who I thought did not get it. I have fallen to this heresy in my own way. And we do it in cities, neighborhoods, gatherings of friends, where we come together to try and find that. The other thing that the Gnostics believed, (coughs) and again, too, there's a whole variety of Gnostic thought, I'm giving you the basics here, was that this God, because they weren't really good... They created these angels or barriers to prevent (coughs) the individual soul going on a journey and embracing their godhood. So there's all these barriers that we have to get past. In the contemporary world, again, these are not spiritual. These are physical. Gilles Lipovetsky talks about the fact that our hedonistic seemingly pleasure-filled culture where we go after pleasure and entertainment and experience like it's going out of fashion are also cultures where we're overcome with anxiety where all of a sudden everyone's wearing active wear and trying to hit goals on their Fitbit and we're pushing ourselves all the time. How many followers? How many miles did you run? How many calories have you lost this month? All of these little barriers that if we can just get past that and fit into those yoga pants enlightenment will come upon us. But what's really interesting is that the Gnostic, once they get past these barriers, the next part of their journey is to get to this place, the perfect place. Here, this is where the hidden God is. The real God. This is the God who's too caught into matter. The early Gnostics, Gnostic Christians, <clears throat> put the God of the Old Testament here. The God who wanted us to obey certain things that were enfleshed in the world. The Gnostic trajectory is actually to get beyond God. And so this is the progressive trajectory to get to a form of spirituality, be that a New Age Eckhart Tolle form of spirituality or a Richard Dawkins scientific enlightenment or a political vision where we move beyond the dogmas of the past. We progress forward to try and get to this perfect place. And for some people, this is a Oprah Winfrey's Super Soul Sunday spiritual moment of enlightenment. For other people, it's turning the cities of America into perfect Scandinavian, crisp, perfectly designed little bubbles. For other people, it's a church purged of revelation, which embraces the currents of the day but this is an alternate gospel. 
Philip Reef, the controversial cultural critic, who in his last days, his conservative Judaism came out powerfully. In his trilogy he was writing as he died, he gave a, a model for culture, <clears throat> which I think is really helpful. He said that there's sort of different types of cultures. <coughs> Firstly, there's what he called first cultures. First cultures are like Papua New Guinea. These are cultures that are animistic, where people live in fear of gods, demons. There's a demon behind every music stand. You know, you have to pay observance to that. They live in fear of fate, of being cursed. It's a very tribal place. Then he said there's second cultures. The second cultures he aligned with Judeo-Christian. Cultures built around God revealing himself, the one true God, a God who loves, a God who shows himself in spirit and in, and in word, in scripture. And so, taking Reef's model, we understand that what we took as we tried to respond to this is the model of relevance, be it in its missional form, its contemporary church form, its seeker-sensitive form, whatever, is, is we borrowed it from what we learned on the mission field. Near my house, in uh, just where I grew up, there's a Presbyterian church built with a snow catcher on its roof. That this is Australia. <laughs> like, we have 100 degree, 115 degree days. We, I don't think it's ever snowed in Melbourne, downtown, ever. That's an example of this culture, when it's communicating to another culture, the danger is we began to realize that, you know, we couldn't put people in Uganda in British tweed suits as they preached. Part of the science of missiology was asking the question, how do we bring the gospel but not colonize these people? How do we raise indigenous leaders? How do we raise local forms? How does this show us what parts of our Christianity are actually Western? So we took that idea to our engagement with post-Christian culture and we began to ask all these questions. Some of them were right, you know, are we too uptight on alcohol? Is this wrong? Is dancing wrong? Should we show movies in, in church? Should we go to that bar? All these questions which needed to be asked. But we took the practice of missiology where the danger is the second Christian culture colonizes the first. But Reef says there's a third culture. He says in the West, I don't know why there's an eye there. In the West, a third culture has sprung up. He would align it with the progressive culture, this we're talking about. If this culture or this Gnostic trajectory is getting beyond everything, deconstructing everything, we can pile this trajectory in there, we can pile postmodernism in there, we can pile critical theory, which has totally taken over our universities, the thought of, of men we came out of the Frankfurt School who say every Western convention and tradition must be thoroughly deconstructed, is that we have a culture which totally defines itself against that. It doesn't state itself in the positive. Its goal is to deconstruct everything here. And what happens is that when this culture tries to do mission to that culture, this culture colonizes that culture. My story, my story was being part of really the beginnings of what was much of the missional church story. I was at the beginning of that in Melbourne in the 90s. And I began to notice something where we had a whole bunch of churches planted who in many ways probably went down that journey of deconstructing church form, structure, to fit into the emerging culture we saw. But the story of much of that was almost all of those churches didn't survive. They encountered tremendous fragility. The ability to hold it together once we'd lost classic forms was almost impossible. 
And then although many of the people leading those churches tried to hold on to an orthodox faith, the temptation of many of the people within and some of the leaders to then etch into that place where they're deconstructing their theology as well was powerful. So I began to question this tremendous fragility. I also began to notice that there were churches in Australia which seemed to take relevance and then take it up by 10 who became super cool beyond even seemingly the culture cool and were able to attract stacks and stacks of people and gain in the very harsh Australian media landscape towards religion in a country, your country is founded on religion, our country is founded on rejecting religion. You guys got together, the Mayflower comes in, you guys have a prayer meeting. In Australia, the first convict ship gets in, the second ship that gets in is the Lady Julia, a prostitute ship. The British troops say, hey, go in the bush, here's some rum, and it's an orgy. Prayer meeting, orgy. (laughs) And utopia, dystopia. Um, And, you know, in that environment, though, some of these churches are getting recognition because they're able to gather cool young people in urban places. But talking to people involved, what's stunning is that there's an 18-month circle turnover. I call it the churn and burn where some of Australia's most successful churches are running on an 80 or 90 percent annual turnover. I call that flash mob church. You know flash mobs where you can say, hey, we're going to gather 1,400 people to sing God Save the Queen in Times Square. Um, Why would you do that? Anyway, um, and then it looks fantastic for this moment. There's 1,400 people sing God Save the Queen, and they just disperse, unconnected. So I began to ask the question, the pivot I think we need to make, and I'm not chucking out relevance, hear me, we still need to be relevant. I'm not advocating here we all become Amish or go back to, I don't know what, you know, irrelevance. (laughs) But I think there's a pivot from relevance to resilience. Resilience is so needed now, not just for the church in this progressive environment, but for individuals. I have 22-year-olds coming to my church who can't make a phone call, who are overracked with anxiety, who have been given everything, self-esteem message, they have more options in the world, they've had international holidays since they were little kids, they've got iPads, they've been on the internet their whole life, and they are racked with not being able to face anything difficult that comes along their path. Resilience is this new posture that we are in the business of. When the apostles went into the world, these bumbling meatheads from Galilee, through the risen Christ and the Spirit, they're transformed into these incredibly resilient men, who many of whom meet their death at the executioner's hand. There is something that we do about resilience in Australia unreligious. The great religious story is the story of revival amongst Aboriginal people whose land was taken, but got the Bible. I can show white Australia what it is to be resilient, living off the land, not building heaps, but knowing where the water holes are. They would have song lines, these mental memories of the maps that they would follow, singing their way through the Australian landscape, which will kill tourists. happens all the time. This ability to live in extremely difficult places and circumstances. One of the things that's happened in our culture, because of the third culture, because of the postmodern moment in the 90s, is that the church got on board with an overwhelming cultural sensibility to just blow everything up, destroy stuff, wreck it. This anti-institutional moment where everyone wants to turn against the institutions, but it's so weird. When I talk to the community development experts at my church, and I've got people who go to third world countries and advise them, we've got a lot of people at a church like that. When something happens like Ebola in Liberia, what's the problem? Lack of institutions. When we look at why ISIS hasn't been able to establish its caliphate in Syria and Iraq, why? Because the institutions in Syria and Iraq fell in the Sunni heartland. When we look at Russia and Putin's oligarchy, his kleptocracy of stealing everything, why? Because after the Soviet Union fell, 
Boris Yeltsin was not able to re-establish institutions. Institutions matter, yet we know that when we're talking about other countries, but in our countries, we just want to tear them all down. And there's an understandable reality to that because they have been corrupt, but if instead of reforming, we don't want to come in with healing hands. We want to come in with hand grenades and just blow everything up. Human history has arranged itself into different ways of relating. One of the ways of relating is what I call the macro. This is the public sense where you come together with people. When I meet an Australian or a New Zealander overseas, it's like you've got to say hello, you've got to talk. It's like, hey, g'day. Or if you're New Zealand, kia ora, bro. This, that just totally lost on you. Um, this, this sense of someone who is, I don't know, but is part of a bigger story that I am part of, my ethnicity, my history, all of that stuff. This is the United States of America. This is the European Union. This is Australia. This is the Commonwealth. Those large places. This is going to a Portland Timbers game, wearing your team colors. And you don't know everyone in that stadium, but everyone's wearing green. It's your city. It's this weird feeling that comes together when you're part of something, but as individuals, but part of this bigger thing. Then throughout history, there's been this middle band Military units throughout history in almost every army from the simplest to the most complex have gathered themselves around numbers of around 150 to 300. This is known as Dunbar's number. Almost every tribal group from the Laplanders of Finland to the Australian Aboriginals at the bottom of the earth have arranged themselves in groupings around 150 to 300. This is your classic village size. This is a grouping that would be a trade union. The Masonic Lodge used to be all across you know, Europe and the world. Numbers where you come together, where it's not super intimate, but you know everyone's name and you create these things. This is the institutional space. The institution's bigger than this. But throughout human history, in, in Great Britain in the 18th century, this is what coffee shops were. The whole coffee shop thing we're doing, you used to pay a membership tithe to be part of it. They would have a set discussion about that night. There'd be different political ones, creative ones, art ones. And there was points where the British government and the French government banned coffee houses because they just had so much social power. Now we're just simply looking for the power to recharge our iPhones. And then the smallest one is the micro. This is the individual, maybe spouse, basically the people who you're happy to be nude around. Now that could be the middle space for you, I don't know who you are, but normally one or two people. Now what's really interesting, this is how humans have existed. This big is a bridging space, ideals, and then work through here and then interpret into individual lives. This is why you have a caucus system in your political presidential primaries. So that candidates could not run a campaign of demagoguery, just printing newspapers, but had to come in and actually meet people face to face in groups of 150 to 300 in the colonies. Sorry for telling you your history. I feel like a bit of a winner, arrogant person. Anyway, whatever. Um, what's happened though is there's something really interesting coming in the mid-century. Robert Putnam puts points at it in his book, Bowling Alone, where he says there's this collapse of the middle space. All of these different organizations, he talks about trade unions, African-American groupings, political groupings. Uh, you have ethnic groupings, Italian you know, social clubs, you have sporting clubs, you have bowling, is that how you bowl? Yeah. Right hand? Um, bowling alleys, these groupings where like 150 to 300 people come together, start collapsing and they all think it's just them. This is the story of the church. The Masonic Lodge's demise in the West is similar time to the church. Trade union membership has decreased at a similar rate to the church. There's this element where, because of this trajectory of radical individualism, of deconstructing stuff, of anti-institutionalism, has actually created a new reality where life now looks like this. The individual's rights, wants, desires have expanded and the macro has gotten bigger. The internet, social networking, 
offers this facsimile, a mirage of this middle space, and people don't know how to inhabit there. This is why coming to church every four weeks is now a new norm. This is why we have text breakdowns. The youth group leader getting text five minutes before someone's supposed to give a talk. Someone's meant to turn up and provide tea and coffee. Yeah, I can't make it. This whole new reality where we don't know how to do institutional life because it requires the Gnostic self to die to self. So when you try and plant missional churches in there, when you try and plant liquid communities in a liquid culture, they wash away. So in the caustic, corrosive, eroding reality of this world in cities like yours and mine, we have to be the builders of this space. We're now in Isaiah, rebuild the broken down places, build up the desolate spaces. It's time to stop tearing down. It's now time to rebuild. Our moment of cultural marginalization can be one of our greatest moments because this has been evacuated and this is deeply key to being a human Turn to, the best, turn to the person next to you and talk about that. Just real quick, I'm just going to say one thing. So real quick, so just quickly. This is what contemporary Christianity looks like in lots of places. We have the podcasting, conference-going person who is a Christian but now is de-churched, who's making it all up themselves. They are their own bishop, pope, and deacon. You also then have this, it's this thing where we're trying to make this as big as possible to serve the needs of these people here and just running this thing constantly, which is burning people out. These people come for a while. These people get burnt out. There you go. Discuss. Okay. All right. The implications of what I'm saying has so many permutations that flow down into so many different things. What I want to give is a large-scale response that I think we need to make. If we're pivoting from relevance, pardon me, to resilience, I believe we have to embrace being different. Relevance was all about lessening the differences between us and the broader culture. Increasingly, how we are different becomes advantageous. Arnold Toynbee wrote a giant sort of study called A Study of History, and the question he asked in that book was a whole line of debate that had gone back to the 15th century, an Islamic scholar called uh, Ibn Khaldun, who looked at why cultures rise and fall. The Spengler, different people, and Toynbee had his go, and he noticed that cultures revive by the work of what he called a creative minority. He said that cultures will go through this point where they build up, work hard, earn their wealth, earn their culture, and then the next generation or the third generation, which has no idea of that hard fought one battle, begins to take it for granted and begins to question everything, and then there's this inevitable process of decline. This is Rome. And so he said, there's this point, though, where cultures, whether they're huge civilizations or organizations, are reanimated, rebrought to life by a group who he calls the creative minority. The creative minority is a group who are part of the bigger culture, but they're different, and they are marginalized in some way. Classic example, Jonathan Sachs, the rabbi of the Commonwealth, taking, working on Toynbee's thesis, says the Jews classically are this group par excellence. The amount of Nobel Prizes they have won, the amount of cultural influence compared to their size, they've been in the Western story, but so often discriminated against, so often marginalized. Interestingly, yes, by the Tzoranic culture, but you think every year you take Passover Seder, you're told that beginning night, why is this night different than any other? God's salvation history, you are a Jewish person 
for 364 days of the year. You may feel like everyone else, but there's that moment why you're different. This sense of being called apart, a rediscovery of holiness. He says that the, the creative minority goes through this process of what he calls withdrawal. Where they're told that they don't belong. This is something that leaders also go through. Those dark nights of the soul. The loneliness of leadership. When a leader struggles with a mental health battle, with relational breakdown, with conflict in the church, with grief, with not fitting in somehow, this is where suffering comes in. That process of withdrawal, which our beautiful world in which we live tries to push away with all of our Scandinavian minimalist design, that suffering, death, isolation are parts of the human experience. Ecclesiastes 3, there's a time to celebrate, there's a time to mourn. And so this creative minority is marginalized, similar to what the church is happening And at this point in time where we feel the cultural weight coming against us, we need to reframe that as God putting us where people of God have done their best work throughout history. And he says there's this thing where they realize that they're distant from the culture. And what that distance from the culture does is it enables them to look back at the idols of the culture. I learn more about Australia being overseas than I do in Australia. Tipping. We don't do tipping. I come to America, it's tipping, it's so uncomfortable. I feel so uncomfortable, I'm signing things, thing. I feel like I'm paying the person. Why do I feel uncomfortable? Because I don't realize it in Australia, but Australia was a convict culture where you don't put your head above other people. It's mateship, it's egalitarian. I don't want you, the guy in the, in the waiter to serve me. I feel so uncomfortable. Only by coming and ordering a coffee in America do I realize something about my country thousands of kilometers away. So you begin to look back and see the idols of your culture. The next process is so interesting. Look at Ignatius of Loyola, wanting to be this playboy shot by a cannon, that's got to hurt, who then goes on this religious thing and finds himself in a cave. John Calvin, a religious refugee, Meant for a life of study, finds himself in Geneva, escaping with the French Protestants and sees something in himself where what we realize is that those idols are also within us. How have I compromised? How do I want the beautiful world? How have I bought into the success metrics of today? How much do I put my point down and t- preach to my people about social media, but how much do I want people to look at my pictures of my Bible on a perfectly wood inlaid table with a flat white, with a glorious piece of latte art showing that I'm both sophisticated and spiritual simultaneously. (laughs) I've done it. And then there is this point where Toynbee says that we must return. That seeing of the idols in the culture, that understanding of how the idols are in us, leads us to this idea of return, this bringing of a healing world. We see what is needed, but we only see it because we've been marginalized. If we weren't pushed out, we would never, ever see it. Toynbee says this is the classic biblical prophet's journey par excellence. This is the people of God going into the desert before they can get to the promised land. This is Moses going to the top of the mountain before he can come back down. This is Jesus going into the grave for three days. Before the prophet returns. That's all right. We're good. Sounds good. This is an embrace of our marginalization. This is realizing that we have this incredible opportunity, but we don't fit in. And maybe we're never going to fit in. And maybe that's what God always wanted. 
I believe the cutting edge of ministry to the West is our cities are where it's going in so many places. And God has placed us here for a reason, to be faithful, to be obedient, to be relevant, to be resilient, and to be different. Turn to the person next to you. What stood out to you? And then we'll have a bit of Q&A for a moment until next 10 minutes or so.